Well, post-colonial studies is uh, really by far the most varied and eclectic of the identity fields that we're passing in review uh, in, this, in, the, in this portion of the, uh, of the course. Uh, eclectic uh, really of necessity, of course, because the immense, of the immense variety of the materials uh, covered, but also because of uh, swirling issues and controversies within Postcolonial studies, or POCO as it's affectionately known, uh, which, um, which kind of pose a number of questions um, from the side that, uh, that, that, that keep things lively, to say the least. We um, are taking up only one strand, uh, developmental strand in postcolonial studies today, uh, a kind of uh, progression. From the work of Said to the work of Baba, which is relatively easily mapped <laughs> simply in terms simply in terms of the uh, of the intellectual agendas of each of them, but there's a great deal else going on, and I, and I suppose I should I should just mention in passing uh, certain topics that we won't um, be discussing uh, at least uh, except possibly in passing, and that however you might really be interested in considering if you do have an interest in this field. Um, the, first, the, the first issue, of course, is who says post-colonial? That is, who says that we're necessarily out of colonialism? Just because the local viceroy packs up and goes home doesn't necessarily mean that things change all that significantly in the so-called post-colonial setting, uh, and it needs to be taken into account, seriously considered, uh, whether or not one isn't still in colonial or colonial <laughs> studies, uh, and that the moniker post-colonial post -colonial might therefore be inappropriately applied. There's also, there's also the question. Uh, that arises in the study of the so-called third world, which is obviously in itself a controversial term. You know, it arises as that which is not comprised as either of the great uh, sort of trajectories of the superpowers during the Cold War. Uh, there is no Cold Cold War, at least allegedly no Cold War any longer, and so the question of the status, nature, and structure of the Third World is obviously wide open. But the issue I mean to touch on in terms of postcolonial studies is whether, in fact, uh, crises uh, and, uh, and concerns with respect to the Third World are necessarily always uh, to be understood in terms of coloniality. That you know, I mean, is is it just that uh, certain parts of the globe have been colonized that constitutes them as they are uh, and shapes their identity? Um, Said, in, in, a, in a very interesting way, takes this up in trying to figure out um, how it is that German Orientalism so very closely resembles French. Orientalism, even though the Germans had no colonial interests in the Middle East, uh, they are uh, they during the whole period, the early 19th century in particular, when German uh, Orientalism is practically indistinguishable from the French, takes up the same concerns, has the same interests. How is it that the French are undoubtedly, in some sense, in Said's view, uh, determined by their colonial interests? And the Germans, who seem so much to reflect uh, French attitudes, have no colonial interests, at least in the Middle East. Uh, how, and, and, and Said's quite, you know, sort of quite honestly tries to come to terms with this. His answer is, well, German uh, Orientalism is simply derived in scholarly terms from French uh, Orientalism. It has the stamp of that thinking uh, and reflects that thinking, and so there you are. He could have said, on the other hand, however, that a certain mindset toward the Third World, and this, is, and this is the point I've been making about this particular issue, dictates a certain way of structuring one's thought about that world irrespective of whether or not there are colonial interests involved. And so that's, that's what I mean um, by raising the question, uh, is coloniality always at issue? In cases of this kind, finally, there's a kind of confusion 
uh, in thinking about these things, a confusion which is, which, which, which is uh, distilled in the history of the British East India Company, which is both nationalist and, as it were, globalizing, but a confusion uh, which comes out more in more recent, uh, the more recent history of, um, of coloniality, and that is, well, what drives coloniality? Is it always nationalism or, as seems increasingly the case in the modern world, is it transnational uh, interests of glo in, uh, in globalization? Uh, is it, in, in, in other words, is the relationship between the colonist and the colonized a relation of, a, of some sort of metropolitan nation with respect to a provincial empire, or is it a relation which is dictated and generated by the economic interests of globalization? This is a complex subject which generates a great deal of debate in the field uh, that we take up today. Uh, but, um, but in a way, I mean, it's, it's, we, we can't just say, well, nationalism isn't important anymore, now it's globalization, because actually um, nationalism seems to have, be, have reappeared uh, in the Bush foreign policy, even possibly to be continued in the Obama foreign policy, uh, and so there's a complex relationship still between nationalism and globalization uh, that uh, needs to be considered and thought about if these uh, social relations are to be clearly understood. And finally, there is within postcolonial studies, uh, especially among those uh, who uh, represent uh, the various uh, colonized <coughs> interests of the world, there's the question, to borrow an expression from Gayatri Spivak, how should the subaltern speak? And it has to do uh, most vividly with the very question which language should the, sh should the subaltern speak in? Spivak's own question is can the subaltern speak at all? Uh, and Said raises that question, as you notice, uh, during the course of his analysis. Um, but, the, but, but the related issue is, okay, suppose the subaltern can speak, uh, suppose um, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, for example, can write a novel, what, no, what language should it be written in? Ngugi uh, campaigned uh, in his more recent career um, not to write <coughs> in English and also to urge other uh, African writers to write in uh, native languages uh, and not in the uh, language of the colonizer. Uh, and this is a, and this is a, uh, a frequently heard opinion um, from within postcolonial studies, but debate swirls around it because, of course, the means of circulation of literary uh, influence uh, is uh, languages that uh, draw upon uh, international publishing possibilities uh, and not languages uh, that can only be uh, grasped and published and disseminated locally. So there too you have a complicated issue uh, bo uh, uh, or controversy on both sides of which there's much to say. But as I say, for us today it's simply a question, or more simply a question because <laughs> when you've got Homi Baba on the syllabus there's no such thing as simplicity, so I should say uh, it's a question of following the trajectory or development uh, between, specifically between uh, Said and Bava. And in beginning to think about Said, I thought we wouldn't think about him. We'd think instead, for a moment at least, about once again about Virginia Woolf. In the second chapter of A Room of One's Own, uh, this young woman, Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmichael, whoever she is, is sitting in the British Library. Uh, and she's thought that she'd spend the morning trying to figure out um, what uh, scholars thought about women. You know, after all, you know, this, this is sort of where the subject is women and fiction. Um, I'm supposed to be addressing these undergraduates on this subject. What do I know about women? I'd better go to the library and find out. So she expects to get a, you know, she, to just to find a couple of books and she'll be all set. Instead, she's simply overwhelmed, and she and there's this avalanche of material, and she submits, you know, maybe a dozen or two uh, call slips, uh, and then sits back waiting for the material to appear. 
And of course, the point of it is that everything in the British Library on the what turns out to be the voluminous subject of women is written by men. Right? Everything. And she begins to take note of the way uh, these things are described in the you know, sort of pre-computer database. Uh, that is to say, how do you classify uh, the various things that men have to say about women? And this is the way it goes. Condition in Middle Ages of, habits in the Fiji Islands of, worshipped as goddesses by, weaker in moral sense than, idealism of, greater conscientiousness of, South Sea Islanders age of puberty among, attractiveness of, offered as sacrifice to, small size of brain of, profounder subconsciousness of, less hair on the body of, mental, moral, and physical inferiority of, love of children of, greater length of life of, weaker muscles of, strength of affections of, vanity of, higher education of, Shakespeare's opinion of, Lord Birkenhead's opinion of, Dean Inge's opinion of, Labriere's opinion of, Dr. Johnson's opinion of, Mr. Oscar Browning's opinion of, and dot, 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 the list can continue. In other words, she sits there, she's, she's simply overwhelmed. And what she, of course, is telling us is that there's lots and lots and lots and lots of opinions on record about women all of them expressed by men. So now, thinking about Edward Said, if Edward Said had taken up Virginia Woolf's project, if Edward Said had undertaken to write A Room of One's Own, the title of it would have been Femaleism, right? Because that's precisely what he means by Orientalism. The vast body of information, some of it scholarly, some of it just sort of sheerly doxological, the vast body of information about peoples called Oriental by and large, especially in the 19th century tradition. Uh, Said's main concern is uh, the peoples of the Middle East, uh, and he shows how it is that there's a, there's a certain reason why this is an appropriate term to use for that tradition of scholarship and philology in the 19th century. In any case, the vast body of material published about these people, and there are, and, and it's perfectly true that there, that, that there's, the, there are the infinitely long shelves of the library devoted to multi-volume treatises on this topic. All of them written by us in the West, us, you know, about this other, who is perpetually in our imaginary and constructed by us in the variety of ways that Said discusses. Uh, page 1811, uh, the right hand column. I'm sorry, I, yes, the right hand column. He says, toward the bottom of the column, Orientalism is premised upon exteriority, that is, on the fact that the Orientalist, poet or scholar, makes the Orient speak, describes the Orient, renders its mysteries plain for and to the West. Just as in Wolf, men's opinions about women, getting themselves expressed in book, make the subject of woman clear to the, an audience of men. All right, so let me, in, in bef before moving to in, in with some more depth and precision into Said's text, uh, let me quickly explain what I mean by saying that Said and Baba constitute a kind of sequence. I'm thinking in particular of Elaine Showalter's distinction between feminist and gynocritical criticism. You remember the distinction, which is echoed, by the way, in Gates's essay. The distinction is, first you get criticism in which the treatment of women in literature by men is the focus of attention, and then subsequently you get criticism in which the women's tradition, the voice of women themselves, is the focus of 
uh, and uh, as Showalter believes, the more fruitful terrain for criticism. So you can see that in that co- that in that context, in way of making in, uh, by way of making that distinction, you can see that Said is decidedly phase one because, of course, Orientalism is about the treatment of the Middle Eastern other by the West, uh, and so it is sort of it it it, it can be slotted in to that same moment. But what's interesting, and, and then Homi Baba uh, is uh, obviously in a variety of ways uh, takes up uh, the subject position of the colonized, of the subaltern. He doesn't leave out the subject position of the, uh, of the colonizer uh, because he sees them as being radically interrelated, uh, but he plainly uh, is as interested in a variety of ways of talking about the traditions of the colonized as he is of talking about the way in which colonization takes place and expresses itself. So in that sense, we can see Said and Baba as belonging to these two phases uh, as mapped by Showalter and, as I say, also in passing by Gates. But actually, and (laughs) I'm sorry for the confusion of this heading, uh, actually there's another way in which Said and Baba can be understood as phase one and phase two. And that has much more to do with the tradition of literary theory which in their ways both Showalter and Gates have rejected, insisting that one needs to commandeer white male literary theory for one's own purposes. I suppose it's a question how, it doesn't, how this issue doesn't come up in Said and Baba. It could perhaps be, be answered by saying that precisely in the situation of colonialism, uh, the I- intellectuals, uh, third world colonized intellectuals, nevertheless are educated uh, in uh, high octane male uh, metropolitan institutions, by which of course one means primarily Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and so, in a certain sense, uh, they come to identify, um, and this is not uh, this is not actually. Um, uh, a thing apart from Baba's argument about, th- ab- uh, about hybridity, they come to identify in some measure with the educational agenda of the colonizer and participate in it. Now that's speculative. It may simply be that we have missed out on those moments when um, Said and Baba too may be talking about the way in which the white male tradition of literary theory needs to be appropriated, but for the moment what I want to point out is this. Said's Orientalism works very much in the historical moment of what we call structuralism. That is to say, its primary concern is with the binary opposition, a mutual and interdependent binary opposition of central self and decentralized other, uh, including, as we'll see in a minute, the way in which the construction of the otherness of the other is actually covertly also at the same time a means of constructing, defining, delimited, the, delimiting the nature of selfhood or in this case of being Western. And so. There's a fundamental bi- binarism in Said's point of view, which, by the way, has also been uh, often been criticized, and it's been criticized uh, most often from the standpoint of Baba, whom you can see because, if only because he's constantly referring to Derrida's famous essay, *The Double Session*, of which is about Mallarmé, uh, but al- and and also because uh, he appropriates a great deal of the language and style of Derrida you can see that Baba takes with respect to the binarism of structuralism a deconstructive attitude. In other words, his sense of these relations breaks down uh, into, at the very least, a redoubling sense of what he calls double consciousness so that one can't clearly identify colonizer and colonized as a binary opposition. It's more complicated than that. And it's a series of issues that turns on a highly Derridian sense of what one might mean by difference. And so uh, all I want to say is that 
the relation, Sa'id Baba, is phase one, phase two in that regard as well. And by the way, this is a tendency that one can find in other forms of, liter of theory having to do with identity. The relationship between the classical feminism that we have been discussing so far and the gender theory that we will be discussing on Tuesday, is one, especially in the case of Judith Butler, is once again uh, a relation that could be understood as between structuralism and deconstruction. So, um, so, so there too you have a not completely overlapping, but from the standpoint of our concerns in literary theory, nevertheless rather interesting uh, way in which this succession, Said Baba, is phase one, phase two in two different ways uh, that can be uh, identified, I think, usefully. All right, so that then about their relationship. So what, what about Said? How do we, how, how do we get at um, the issues that Said wants to talk about um, and understand the way in which he thinks they have integrity? Um, before, I, I think I'd like actually to begin with a word or two about truth, because Said uh, makes it clear that in a way the demonization of Orientalism that his project undertakes <coughs> isn't really undertaken because Orientalism is necessarily a pack of lies. He's, he, maybe he waffles a little bit about this, but it's not really ultimately the point for him whether Orientalism lies or tells the truth. This is, this is the way he puts it on page 1802 in the right-hand column. A third qualification, one ought never to assume that the structure of Orientalism is nothing more than a structure of lies or myths which, were the truth about them to be told, would simply blow away. I myself believe that Orientalism is more particularly valuable as a sign of European Atlantic power over the Orient than it is as a veridic discourse about the Orient. Uh, nevertheless, what we must respect and try to grasp is the sheer knitted together strength of Orientalist discourse. In other words, you know, I mean, so one of Napoleon's adjutants during Napoleon's campaign through Egypt wrote a ten volume Histoire de l'Egypte. Many of the texts whom, to whom Said mentions in passing in his, uh, in, in, in his introduction to Orientalism are just as long. I mean, you've got 50 volume, sort of gigantic scholarly undertakings. And you've got to admit, well, you know, <laughs> if, if, if they're saying that much, there's got to be something in it that's true. Um, there is, after all, a great deal of knowledge, uh, of a certain kind at least, that has gone into thinking of this kind. And so one can't just say, my point is that none of it's true. And Said uh, is at pains to make a distinction, therefore, between truth and value. It's not that um, Orientalist discourse is necessarily true or false. It is the case, though, that it is insidiously devaluing of its object of attention, that there is an implicit Eurocentrism, which Said does go so far as to consider a form of racism in Orientalism, quite irrespective of any measure or degree of truth that what are, after all, the meticulous researches of a lot of these characters turn up. Uh, for example, on page 1812, uh, the left-hand column, he says, my analysis of the Orientalist text therefore places emphasis, this is about a third of the way down, which is by no means invisible for such representation on the evidence, which is by no means invisible for such representations as representations, not as natural descriptions of the Orient. Now, we might pause for a minute over that as a possible object of critique. Uh, Yet because at the end of his essay, or at the end of the introduction as you have it, uh, you notice Said saying, look, I don't take up here the question of how one might actually write correctly. 
about, you know, about these people. Um, he doesn't take up, for example, the question of what it might be like to be um, uh, uh, sort of a, 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 a representative of these minorities uh, or colonized figures and to write about oneself. He doesn't really take up the question whether the bias of somebody else writing about me, you know, a man writing about a woman, is worse than the bias of my own pre preconceptions and prejudices <laughs> about myself. He admits that he doesn't really have an advanced theory that secures one kind of representation as true or authentic and secures another kind of representation as biased uh, and inauthentic. He says, another scholar will perhaps take this up, I leave it alone in my book. And it is left alone, uh, the problem being that the claim remains that, that, he, that, that he does, um, uh, anticipating uh, many other people who have written on this subject, he does impugn Orientalism as mere representation. That is to say, as not uh, as the opposite, be because it is a representation, the opposite of a natural evocation of an ethos or world. Um, so we just do want to put a little question mark in the margin and say there and say, well, fine, fine. Granted, this is all representation. Uh, where is the text? Where could the text be that would be natural? Is there, for example, any such thing, as we've asked ourselves over the course of the semester, as a natural sign? The sign being arbitrary, <laughs> it does place us already pretty securely uh, in the realm of representation. All right, so all of these questions then posed uh, by Said's uh, sense of the relationship between <coughs> truth and value in the history of Orientalist scholarship. Now, so where is he coming from? Uh, he's quite open about it, uh, and, um, and it's perhaps worth pausing over an, over an idea common to the two scholar theorists who matter most to him, Michel Foucault and the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. Uh, first of all, uh, just uh, to pass in review uh, his, the way in which he's indebted to Gramsci on page 1803, the left-hand column. Said says, culture, of course, is to be found operating within civil society where the influence of ideas, of institutions, and of other persons works not through domination but by what Gramsci calls consent. In other words, it's not just a question of having forced down your throat certain ideas or concepts or laws for that matter, but a circulation of knowledge, so-called, of feeling about things, of ideology, which through consent establishes certain attitudes of, uh, of bias. And so this is what Gramsci, the, the distinction that Gramsci makes between the way in which one is imposed on by actual power and authority and the way in which one is imposed on by the, circu by the circulations of what we've been exposed uh, to in the past uh, uh, as being called ideologies. So to continue, in any society not totalitarian, says Said, certain cultural forms predominate over others, just as certain ideas are more influential than others. The form of this cultural leadership is what Gramsci has identified as hegemony. And this, is a ta and this is a term that you will frequently encounter, particularly in Marxist criticism, but it is also a term very closely related to what for most Western readers is more famous in the work of Michel Foucault, the term power or sometimes power slash knowledge. As you will learn in the excerpt from Foucault that you'll be reading on Tuesday, Foucault, like Gramsci, makes a distinction between power merely as that which is exercised by the police or by the legal arm of society or by the dictator or by the government, and power as the ways, the frequently insidious ways in which knowledge is circulated and made hegemonic. 
that is to say, it made authoritative. And Foucault is, pa is fascinated by the structure of this circulation of knowledge. That is, in fact, the essential subject matter of all of his late work. The way in which we are thinking that we are sort of free contemplative agents in the world, in fact, browbeaten by structures of opinion circulating around us that lull us into feeling that we are in the presence of the truth, whereas, of course, we are only in the presence of one form or another of motivated bias. Uh, so both Gramsci and Foucault make the distinction between uh, absolute power and, as Gramsci calls it, hegemony, and as Foucault calls it, power knowledge. Said is talking here about power knowledge. He's not talking about the imposition of law through force or any other means on a colonized world. He's talking about the way in which opinions construct that world and simultaneously reinforce the authority of those who generate the opinions. He does, however, and I think it's important to point this relatively subtle distinction out, he does, however, disagree um, from Foucault in one respect. On page 1813, he goes back to what we already know about Foucault, which is Foucault's interest, interest in the author function as opposed to the author. <coughs> Authors, generally speaking, Foucault wants to say, are not authorities. Uh, but, simply, but simply vessels of forms of opinion. Certain authors uh, who come very close to being authority we call founders of discursivity, but even in their cases it's the nature of the discourse uh, and not their existence as authors which is important. Said wants to say, I take authors a little bit more seriously than that, and he does on page 1813 in the right-hand column where he says, Foucault believes that in general the individual text or author counts for very little. Empirically, that is to say through my experience, <laughs> empirically in the case of Orientalism and perhaps nowhere else, I find this not to be so. In other words, the authors, the central philologists and, and social historians and explorers and demographers who have written so uh, extensively on this part of the world are authorities. They are the oracles from which generalized uh, and ultimately commonplace opinions disseminate uh, as power knowledge, and it's not a question, therefore, of a kind of silent drumbeat of opinion expressing itself over and over again, which is more what interests Foucault. So, uh, so Said, as I say, uh, distinguishes himself uh, subtly uh, from Foucault in that regard, while nevertheless uh, confessing openly uh, the influence both of Foucault and of Gramsci on his way of approaching his material. So the circulation uh, of power, uh, as, as a circulation of power, I should say, the effect of Orientalism is something that ultimately concerns Said. Well, he says this somewhat rhetorically because he, it obviously does concern him that it has an effect on the peoples in question. But what ultimately concerns Said is the effect of Orientalism on the Eurocentric mind, indeed, the degree to which it even can be said to construct the Eurocentric mind. Page 1806, the right hand column. My real argument is that Orientalism is and does not simply represent a considerable dimension of modern political intellectual culture and as such has less to do with the Orient than it does with our world. Now here you can see the degree to which Said is saying something very similar to what Toni Morrison said in her essay. The existence of black as absence needs to be understood, for example, if we're studying the history of American literature, as the means of constructing whiteness, of, the, of that which liberates whiteness from the forms of constraint uh, under which it's been 
chafing at the beat, at the bit. And Morrison, of course, develops this argument beautifully, and she uh, quite clearly takes it from the fourth chapter of Hegel's Phenomenology of Mind uh, as a way of understanding the master slave <coughs> dialectic. In other words, in Hegel, uh, it's clear uh, as Hegel uh, develops the idea that master and slave are absolutely necessary to each other in a structure of mutuality. The master isn't the master, can't define himself as free or superior without the existence of the slave. The trickiness that the slave learns being in this position of subordination involving the development of all sorts of complicated skills means ultimately that the slave uh, becomes, as it were, that which drives the master technologically and ultimately controls the master uh, in a kind of uh, a fable of class reversal, uh, which, is, uh, which continues to reverse itself again and again and again on various grounds. Um, this is uh, the fable, uh, the or w which at the same time is a philosophy of class relations that we find that, that structures Morrison's argument uh, and which I think also, uh, also structures Said's. And I want to make the transition to Baba um, because obviously this is a form of binarism. Uh, the, the, uh, the two signifiers in relation to each other need each other in the way that we described when we were discussing Saussure and structuralism. I, simp I can't simply say that a red light has positive value. Do you remember the whole argument? I have to see uh, the, red, the, the red light in the context of the semiotic system to which it belongs. I have to see it as being different from or opposed to something else in order to grasp it. I cannot know it positively. In other words, I can only know it negatively. This basic concept of structuralism in the Saussurean tradition is what creates, is what shapes binary arguments of the kind that one finds in Said. We know ourselves negatively as the not other. Is the, ba is, 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 is the basic principle, the theoretical principle, which, under, which underlies uh, obviously uh, aspects of the argument which are also, as, as Said says, empirical. I mean, yeah, I can say it's a structuralist idea, but I really believe it because I've seen it in operation. It, it, it's not just structuralism, in other words. It shares, however, with structuralism uh, a, 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 a theoretical predisposition. And Baba. If you look at page 1879, openly criticizes the premise of binarism of this kind. Not just any bi binarism, but he actually does go directly back to Hegel. In other words, he identifies the source of thinking of this kind, bottom of 1879, right hand column, when he says, It is this ambivalence that makes the boundaries of colonial positionality, the division of self-other, the question of colonial power, the differentiation of colonizer-colonized different from both the Hegelian master-slave dialectic or, and he goes on to mention other things, but I just want to focus on this as a moment in which Baba is, uh, is, 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 is distinguishing himself as clearly as he can uh, from the project of Said. All right, now, this, the passage I just read begins with the word ambivalence. What does Baba mean by ambivalence? Let's try to start there and see if we can work our way into Baba's complex thinking on these matters, uh, first by way of the notion of ambivalence. Well, and I'm going to put this in terms of an historical example. Uh, I, because I hope that will make it a little clearer. There is the ambivalence of the colonizer toward the colonized. In other words, it's not just one mindset that drives colonization. In the historical experience of England in the East, in the East India Company, there are two distinct phases, phases which actually repeat themselves recurrently uh, even throughout the 20th century. The first in the 18th century 
is the period of the government of the East India Company by Warren Hastings, who in a certain sense was interested in what we call going native and also encouraged uh, all of his provincial administrators to do likewise. Hastings, in other words, in Saidian terms, knew a great deal about the Orientalized other. He knew all the local languages and dialects. He knew all the customs. He, knew, he really knew everything there was to know uh, and in a certain sense was a person who did go native while at the same time uh, wielding an iron, with an iron grip of authority, power over the colonized other. His ambivalence, it, it, he himself then embodies a certain ambivalence in not giving an inch as to the actual control of authority while at the same time seeming to become one with the other. But then there's the historical ambivalence which expresses itself in a completely different attitude, an, a, an attitude which surfaced in the East India Company early in the 19th century. Uh, under the uh, under the supervisorship of Charles Grant. Now Charles Grant uh, was uh, as a there had been a tremendous revival of fundamentalist religion, mainly Methodism, uh, in England, uh, and this and this evangelical enthusiasm spread itself into the interests of the empire, and so Charles Grant and others like him. No, had no longer had any interest at all in going native, uh, but on the other, but but on the contrary, insisted that a standard of Englishness, and in particular the, sta the standard of the English Bible, the coming of the English book that Baba talks about at the beginning of his essay, be firmly implanted, and that the imposition of Englishness on the colonized other be the agenda of colonization. The famous historian Thomas Babington uh, Macaulay uh, codified this attitude uh, in, what in, in, in a famous document he wrote, in it be it came soon to be infamous document called The Minute on Education, uh, which insisted that the education of the Indian peoples uh, in the, uh, uh, under the regime of the East India Company be, be conducted con strictly according to English models, that missionaries no longer try to adapt their ideas to local customs uh, and folkways, but that everything be strictly Anglicized. So this is a completely, di completely different attitude toward colonization and it can be understood as a sort of historical ambivalence. Um, I'd, actually, I, I'd, I'd actually like to pause over an example of what you might call the Warren Hastings moment, um, a vicious example, although an absolutely fascinating one, in the disturbing masterpiece by John Ford called The Searchers. I hope some of you at least know that film. Uh, the John Wayne character uh, is a, a kind of, um, sort of lone stranger so, which is of course not infrequent in the Western, um, who uh, shows up at the house of some relatives and hears that, w that a daughter has been abducted by the Native Americans, by the Indians. Now the thing about John Wayne is that he's a vicious, in this film, <laughs> is that he's a vicious racist, that he absolutely hates the Indians. But he is not a vicious racist from the standpoint of ignorance. He is in fact a person who is, has in himself in a certain sense gone native. He knows all the, the Indian languages and dialects. He knows all their customs. He has, uh, he has throughout a lifetime made a careful study of the people he hates. And this, is a, 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 and this is a volatile mixture to be exposed to in a film because we're much more comfortable with the idea that hatred arises out of ignorance. Right? And, the, and, 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 and what is so deeply disturbing about, about John Ford's The Searchers is that it is, it is a portrait of absolutely vicious racism uh, which is, which I again, you know, Said says, hey, it's not necessarily truth. But we do have to acknowledge, you know, a certain local thick description. We have, we have, we have to acknowledge that there's a that, that there's quite a bit of information 
at this person's disposal. Um, and all of that is borne out in the uh, characterization of John Wayne in this film. Warren Hastings was a lot like that. Warren Hastings knew everything about people whom he ultimately didn't really respect and whom he insisted on uh, ruling with the iron fist of authority. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that, 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 that Baba is thinking about when he thinks about the ambivalence of the colonizer, the relationship between knowledge and value, as it's already been enunciated in Said, but also the fact that there is more than one mindset for the colonizer. There's the local knowledge mindset, and, there's, and, and there is the sort of raising the absolute unequivocal standard of the colonizing uh, 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 of, of the colonizer, uh, that these are two different attitudes, each of which dictate different strategies, particularly strategies of education. So that's ambivalence, uh, the ambivalence of the colonizer. Then there's the ambivalence of the colonized, um, and that too uh, has to be uh, understood as a complex relation to co-optation. The anecdote with, with, with which Baba begins I think is fascinating uh, and well worth attending to. You have um, not a colonizer but someone thoroughly co-opted, uh, an evangelical uh, uh, converted Christian uh, of Indian descent um, who, is, who represents in a way that the people he finds sitting under the tree re trees reading the Bible consider to be completely authentic because he believes uh, and is perfectly happy to believe that the Bible, in, and, for that and for that matter Christianity itself, is an English gift. But he's met with the response of people who resist that, who say, you know, this is very interesting stuff. You know, we wish we could have some local authority for it. Our understanding is we got this, this book, this book, directly from God. Right? That's our understanding, and we have our own attitude toward it. Sure, maybe we'll get baptized one of these days, but in the meantime we've got to go home and take care of the harvest. So, you know, we, we'll get around to that, don't worry about it. And by the way, if we get baptized, we certainly can't take uh, the Eucharist uh, because, you know, that's, that's eating meat. We don't eat meat. You know, we are who we are, and so that and, and, and you can see that these cunningly insinu insinuated provisos uh, to the attitude that um, that the, the missionary wants to inculcate in them, in a very real way, completely undermines his purpose. They don't think of it as the English Bible. They won't accept it as the English Bible. They will only accept it as an authority that's mediated by their own values which transforms the document. I mean, you can see it again as this is 1813, as Baba points out. This is precisely at the moment when we're moving, when the regime of authority is moving from the Warren Hastings paradigm to the Charles Grant paradigm, uh, and it's no longer possible to think in terms of adapting the Bible to local beliefs and circumstances. And so this is a moment in which the complexity of the attitude of the colonized is brought up. There's the attitude of the suborned missionary, and there's the more complicated and interesting attitude of the people he encounters sitting under these trees. Um, the, uh, page 1886, the right-hand column. That's actually not the passage I wanted to read. Uh, page 1881, the left-hand column. This is a very difficult passage. Everything in Baba is difficult. Um, I, want to, I, I think I want to gloss it by suggesting to you that what he's talking about is that the ambivalence, which and, and we might as well say right out that this ab ambivalence is, he has a term for, and it's hybridity is the double consciousness of the colonized hovering between submission, that is to say submission to authority, but with a difference, submission to authority on one's own terms, 
and on the other hand, acquiescence, acquiescence in authority as given, which of course is basically the position of the missionary. And with that said, uh, I'll read the passage in which uh, Baba describes this hybridity in the double consciousness of the colonized. The place of difference and otherness, or the space of the adversarial within such a system of disposal as I've proposed, is never entirely on the outside or implacably oppositional. Not just, in other words, again, as a question of us versus them. It is a pressure and a presence that acts constantly, if unevenly, along the entire boundary of authorization, which is also authority, that is, on the surface between what I've called disposal as bestowal, and I take that meaning submission, you know, simply, okay, fine, I, I, I give in, and disposition as inclination, which is, hey, I kind of like that, I go along with it, uh, I give in spontaneously. Now, to give in uh, simply as a form of recognizing that one's beaten, <laughs> you know, as a form of submission, is puts one in the position of what Baba calls sly civility. And this is the position uh, uh, that I'd like to go back to for a moment as being very closely related to what Gates calls signifying. Uh, Baba gives a number of examples of this sly civility uh, in his text, but of course it's all present in the clever and wonderfully rich ironies of these figures sitting under the trees in his opening anecdote. But let me just give you an example of how sly civility works as a form of signifying and as a stance of colonized resistance, a recuperation of the will perhaps in a postmodern sense, which is nevertheless not rebellious, not in any way um, envisioning an overthrow of authority, but is a means of living in the framework of authority. Just a quick example and then I'll let you go. Two African American people are having a conversation in the presence of a white person, and they cheerfully and, 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 and with, you know, with, with, with broad smiles on their face refer to this person in his presence as Bill. Now, Bill is a derisive and derogatory term for white people, uh, and, as, and the white person standing there has two choices in response to hearing himself referred to as Bill. He can either take umbrage and say, oh, why are you saying that about me? I'm a nice guy, you don't, you, you don't want to say that, uh, in which case the needling effect of the term um, has taken hold. Or he can play the fool and pretend that he doesn't know that he's being signified on uh, and pretend that, well, it's perfectly okay to be called Bill. And either way, you see, it's a win-win situation. The, uh, the, the, this, you know, this, is this, th this guy, Bill, is the slave owner. Right? You know, he likes to get along with people, uh, so he's sitting around having this conversation and he hears them calling him Bill. Right? So because, he's, be, be, because there's an element of good nature in his slave-owning personality, he's stuck. He can either complain that people are treating him unfairly, <laughs> which of course <laughs> is neither here nor there in terms, of the power, in, in terms of the structure of power involved, <coughs> or he can play the fool and pretend that he doesn't even notice that he's being made fun of. Uh, and so either way, this is an example of that sly civility which signifies on the man and which makes it clear that while the structure of power can't be overthrown anytime soon, there nevertheless is a way of living at least uh, of keeping one's sense of humor within the existing structure of power uh, while giving the man a hard time. Uh, that is the attitude, the set of attitudes that Baba is articulating in his notion of the hybridity of the colonized, uh, which takes the form in performance. We're going to have a lot more to say about performance on Tuesday. Which takes in the form, takes the form in performance of this sly civility. I think it's page eighteen 
89 that he gives us that expression, which I think you should keep hold of, which I would compare very closely with what Henry Louis Gates calls signifying. Okay, see you on Tuesday.